Um, awesome. Well, we are jumping in to our second installation of our Pass It On series. Let me just tell you, though, before we've been talking about what's next for us as this lease is running out here, and I told you about a opportunity that seems to be unfolding for us, and we've gotten news that it's looking really good, and we will know a definitive answer by this week. And so please be praying, and we will tell you as soon as possible. So stay tuned. What we know is that God is good. He loves us, and he's going to take good care of us. Today, I want to talk to you in this series called Pass It On about the disciples' fuel, the disciples' fuel. I, I was so encouraged last week as we unpacked this thought that you don't have to be a disciple. Like you, can, you can stay in the crowd and you can be loved by God. You're not loved by what you do. The, the Bible says, how great is the love the Father's lavished on us that we might be children of God. You become his child, you are loved. But we then talked about how the joy that comes from being a disciple is the abundant life that God promised. And so why wouldn't you want to be? We talked about that there is joy when you decide to take that step to follow and obey. It was very encouraging to me to get to the end of the service and say, so who is actually ready to make that decision saying, Lord, count me in. I want to be your disciple. Over three quarters of every service raised their hand. I was overjoyed. And yet here's what I know. Uh, having done this for about 25 years, I'm saddened by two things. I'm, I'm, I'm saddened when people don't take the step to be a disciple. And I'm also saddened by something I've seen through the years where, where people say, yes, count me in, and, and they take off. They shoot out of the gates, or, or they peel off the starting line, and they're, they're, they're going 90 to nothing. And then they run out of fuel, and they peter out, and, and they stop, and they settle for less. And so that's why I want to talk to you about the secret fuel of a disciple. What I believe is that love is the fuel for discipleship. And let's look at John 15, eight and nine. It says that this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my, showing yourselves to be my, as the Father's loved me, so have I loved you now remain in my love. You've got to see the inextricable connection between being disciples and love. And this, I mean, we read this verse, our minds should explode. As the Father has loved me, says Jesus. So Jesus, the most beautiful, precious being in the universe, and how the Father loves him. And we're like, of course God would love Jesus. He's Jesus. It's his son. But Jesus says this, so I have loved you. And I know you, and you know you, and you know your stinky breath that you woke up with this morning, and your toe jam, and your, your things that you said that were so dumb this week, and the thoughts that you had. And you're like, what? Father, the way you love Jesus, that's, with that same love, Jesus is loving you? I mean, that is mind-boggling. I love love. Have I ever told you about how Steph and I fell in love? I'm going to tell you again. <laughs> First time I saw her was in Ryan's Steakhouse, a good Texas restaurant. Uh, we, were in, we were in Texas. And it was the senior dinner like it was a dinner that the church was putting on. So there were just 20 of us. They had us in a separate room. And like any guy who's graduating from college still single, I am scanning every room I walk into, right? <laughs> I don't remember seeing another girl. I looked and in a oversized orange and white rugby shirt <laughs> with wire rim glasses was this mystery <laughs> named Stephanie. And she just sat there so content to be her, if you know her. She's just content sitting there being her. And I was like, who is that woman? And then we went around the room and said what we were going to do after college. And she says, I am, I'm signing up to do the discipleship training school that's in this church. And I was like, holy smokes, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Not because she was doing it. I, 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 was, I was already signed up. 
So I was like, this is going to be interesting. And so we started getting to know each other as, you know, there'd be different times that the group would so socially get together. Our school was smaller than, than the one in this church. So there was just about 20 of us. So we'd all hang out, watch movies and do different things. And I, uh, this thing just leaped out of my mouth because I found out that she couldn't go home. She, we were in Texas and she's from Chicago. And so she mentioned that she couldn't go home uh, for Thanksgiving in front of a group of us. And I immediately was like, oh, you can just come to my house. Okay, back then I didn't watch Hallmark movies. I didn't realize every time someone comes to your house, you're going to marry them, right? <laughs> you know, for, for a holiday. Uh, it's funny now, I'm like, we, I, my family had never, I, I mean, I was thinking, oh, my parents will be great. They're so hospitable. We had never had anyone over at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Uh, so she comes, has Thanksgiving meal, and, and, and then we go for a walk as a family. And she's on the walk, and I'm looking at her going like, you feel like family to me. Oh, it gets better. We, there was a no dating policy in the training school. I don't think we have that in our school. We do have that? Oh, I'm sorry. No wonder the school hasn't doubled in size. I'm a, I might talk to the directors about that. Um, but we had a no dating policy, which was good, uh, so I could focus. But at the end, we go on, a, we go on our outreach to Turkey. And uh, so, so um, there was a whole group of, you know, a, a bunch of us. And so in order to put us in their seats, they just put us in alphabetical order. Her name, last name Herman, my last name Herber. So we were sitting next together, and the plane configuration was 252. Two. It was a big plane. So here we are in the love seats. <laughs> a single guy, single girl who had spent Thanksgiving together for nine hours on a plane. You can talk about a lot of things in nine hours. Uh, and, and what I realized is that we were talking, we were, we were going, man, we have so many similarities. Like we love the same things. We love the same food. We like to want a vacation in the same spots. We want to... The most awkward thing is we talked about the silly movie called All I Want for Christmas. And, and one of us, I don't remember which one, said, oh, that little girl, her name was Hallie. She's so cute. And I said, I'm going to name my first kid Hallie. And she's like, no, I'm going to. And then we looked at each other. That was awkward. We hadn't even gone out on a date yet. We get to Turkey. And uh, the class, most of the class would run in the mornings. And what was interesting is one by one, people started dropping out until one day I show up for my morning run and it's just me and Steph. I don't think we missed a day for the rest of the time. We, did, we were faithful to run. We were running for love, right? We were running on love. Uh, do you know that you were actually created to fall in love? So the, the, the psychological composition of a human is to fall in love. And, and, and I was looking at reasons we fall in love. This is from Psychology Today. This is fascinating to me. They listed eight reasons. Number one, attraction to beauty, an outer beauty or an inner personality traits. Number two, meeting of needs. When a person fulfills needs for companionship, acceptance, and excitement, we fall in love. Number three, time alone. Spending time one-on-one -on -one with a person like nine hours on a plane flight to Turkey can contribute to the development of passion. Similarities. When people share interests, goals, desires, or beliefs. Mystery. When a woman has a orange and white rugby shirt and wire rim glasses across the room at Ryan's Steakhouse, there's something uncertain, intriguing, and thought-provoking about them. Reciprocal liking. When you feel liked, you're more likely to like someone. Environment. Being in an unusual or stimulating environment can spark passion, like an unusual or stimulating church. <laughs> Societal affirmation. Your family or your community affirms the relationships and acceptance from a person's social network inspires love. And it's not just psychological, it's also physiological. There's actually something that goes on in your body and your brain. So anthropologist Helen Fisher did a study of people who claimed to be madly in love and looked at their brains through an MRI scan. And what they saw is that love takes a primitive path through the brain. And the good feeling we experience in love is driven by dopamine. Baby, you are my drug. Um, <laughs> 
the brain chemical found in our motivation to find food, water, and everything else. So when you're falling in love, there's a, a physical and chemical changes happening in your body. So your, your body's releasing large amounts of neurotransmitters, oxytocin, and dopamine. And so dopamine fires up the brain's reward centers, resulting in that euphoric state. Oxytocin helps you have that warm trust in someone. And, and then this was also interesting. In those first few months of a relationship, your serotonin level drops, causing your cortisol, the stress hormone, to flood your body. And so that's often why your heart's beating faster, your pupils are dilating, and you're feeling butterflies in your stomach. Here is something interesting, though. It's not just in romantic love that these things are going on. It's also in the first months of a woman having a child. that this dopamine, this oxytocin is being released. I, I wanna tell you, you as a human are made to fall in love. And so isn't it interesting that when a religious leader comes up and asks Jesus what the greatest commandment, you know, they're like, I wanna know what to do for God. Listen to what it says, this is Matthew 22. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Okay, and when we think about laws, we're like, do this, don't do this, don't you dare do that, don't you touch that, don't you say that, don't you... And he says, so what's the greatest commandment in the law? Listen to this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I want to propose to you today that the main goal of your life is to continually grow in your love for God. Like, what's the greatest goal of your human existence? It's to grow in love for God. And that's really good news because you were actually made to love. Like, everything's working for you. Like, psychologically, physiologically, you are made to love. So, Last week, we talked about a simple definition of a disciple as someone who follows and obeys Jesus. To, to be a disciple is to follow and obey Jesus. And then we read this verse, John 15, 8 through 11. So let me expound on this verse. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father's loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands... You will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy, say joy, joy. my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So last week we said a better, a more thorough definition for a disciple is this, a joy-filled relational attachment to Jesus. A joy-filled relational attachment to Jesus in which we're transformed into his Lightness. So we started talking about, you know, someone says, you're called to be a disciple, and then you're called to make disciples. I don't think anyone in this room would say, uh-uh. No, you'd say, yeah, that's clearly in the Bible. Jesus is calling people, come and be my disciples, and then he says to his disciples, go and make disciples. To make disciples, I think everyone would agree with that. But here's the, here's the next thing that we say. So someone says, you're called to be a disciple. You're called to make disciples. They go, great, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And so last week, we started talking about the left brain versus the right brain. Because what we usually tell people to do in a church then is, okay, you want to be a disciple? Okay, well, you need to start this Bible reading program and you need to memorize these amounts of scripture and then you need to meet with people and you need to go through these actions. And while that is not like completely false, we end up like that race car that shoots out of the gate and then runs out of gas. Because that's, just doing the right thing is, is not how you're motivated as a human. Um, being a mom of an infant is hard. Okay? I've never been one, um, but I've had a front row seat to watch one. Um, like, dirty diapers, they're like, you feed them from your body, 
They're like literally sucking life out of you. Um, then what do they do in return? They're screaming, they're pooping. Um, and yet, uh, the, the vast majority of moms in life, like they, you'll watch them and they, they have a, a, a baby. And sometimes it's actually a little distracting. I, I'm watching one right now. She is not watching me. She's watching her baby, <laughs> Shannon. And, uh, and I'm so trying to be entertaining right now, but I can't compete with her baby because it's her baby. And like she has these psychological and physiological reasons that she's just drawn to the baby. So she's just going to naturally stare at her baby and naturally hold her baby and cuddle her baby. And, you know, um, only the most broken moms don't ooze love onto their children. It's only moms that didn't receive some kind of love. Because even, even pretty broken, messed up women still like... They, they hold, they coo, they, they, they touch, they speak to, and, and, and they do a lot of hard things. Why? Because they're motivated by love. They're bonded through love. There is a joy-filled attachment to that child. So last week we were talking about the left brain and the right brain because the left brain is where we start getting all like the logic and we think, okay, I'm going to be a disciple. So I'm going to learn all this doctrine and I'm going to learn all these beliefs and then I'm going to do all these practices. But we talked about how the right brain is actually moves faster and it's actually our gut response and it's actually how we are, what our character comes from and the, the right brain. So listen to this. I'm going to read from Dr. Jim Wilder. Left brain discipleship emphasizes beliefs, doctrine, willpower, and strategies, but neglects right brain loving attachments, joy, emotional development, and identity. Ignoring right brain relational development creates Christians who believe in God's love, but have a real difficulty experiencing it in daily life, especially during distress. So we start out, we're trying to, we're trying to do all these things from God, and then we stop, or we hit a crisis, and let me keep reading. He says this, I'm not suggesting that familiar left-brain strategies are unimportant in discipleship. Bible teaching, scripture, meditation, belief strategies, and the choices we play, an essential role in forming our character. We don't grow without developing these left-brain skills. However, without the right, proper right-brained relational and emotional environment, our fruit will be meager. When the right brain and left brain work in harmony, character transformation comes commonplace in our communities. Last quote. Listen to this. Practice, practices seem to work for some people, but not for others. What I realized later was that the people who did not respond to training likely had right brain obstacles, low joy, isolation, a lack of loving community, poor identity formation, and unhealed trauma. Each of these was a relational, emotional problem requiring right brain development. Here's what I believe about everyone in this room. Um, you're here because I think you probably want to be here. The reason if you wouldn't say, I've signed up to be a disciple, like Jesus, though none go with me, still I will follow, I will follow you. This is the course that I want my life to go on. Like I will follow and obey and, and then I will invest my life in other people. If you haven't signed up for that, I don't believe it's because you're just this really bad person. I actually don't believe it's because you're actually wanting to be a Satan worshiper. Um, I actually believe it's because you haven't experienced the depth and goodness and the addictive and overwhelmingly drawing love of God. Because when you fall in love, you, you can't help but want to run after someone. Um, and you can't help but want it to serve and bless them. Too much of the time, we think discipleship is like this. Steph, this is my wife, if you don't. Steph! Go give me some water. <laughs> I, I'd say she'd probably do it, but she didn't. Um, 
There is such a difference between that and, oh my goodness. I am overwhelmingly in love with you. You are the most beautiful woman on the whole earth to me. You bring meaning to my life. You're my inspiration. I want to have you near me. Um, do you mind getting me some water? <laughs> she said, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I can't tell you the amount of things I've changed in my life since I've been married. Uh, one of the main ways uh, I've changed is in the area of socks. Socks, S-O-C-K-S. Um, <sighs> I hate it when socks don't have their matching partner. You know, like unequally yoked socks. <laughs> Drives me nuts. So to me, at the end of the day, when I take off my socks, it is only rational for me to fold them back together and place them in the laundry. Because we have a big laundry basket and one sock might get left behind if they're apart. So it makes total sense to me to fold them together. And after about three or four times of Steph saying, Robert, please don't fold your socks together. It creates an extra step for me to wash them. Like that doesn't make sense to me because I'm like, little black sock sometimes gets lost and then the only hope is little Argyle sock. And it's a horrible match. So it makes sense to fold them together, but out of love, I put them down. <laughs> Unconnected. Um, not a big fan of dishwashing. Really not. Um, yesterday, Steph had to go do something, or maybe it was Friday. Uh, she had to go do something. I, I walk in the kitchen, and I'm like, oh, it is... It is a mess. And I'm like, I don't feel good. But I had this thought. I don't want Steph to come back and then just be overwhelmed after she's already been running an errand. And so for the joy set before me, I endured the sink, <laughs> scorning its shame. Right? Why? It's been, it, I am motivated. And even more, okay, so think about this. If Steph came to me and she's like, Robert, you better take me out. And you better bring me a rose tonight. I mean, I'd do it. But how much more when it's flowing out of my heart? Like, I, I can tell you that after Turkey, where we fell in love, like, no one was calling me saying, Robert, I'm just making sure th to keep you accountable to think about Steph today. Like, are you, are you spending time having some thoughts on her? Like, I couldn't get my mind off of her, right? Or, Robert, I, I'm just making sure that you take her out this week. No, I, I was trying to get time with her every day. Are you following me? So what happens is that Scripture says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. And, and church, what we've done is said, we focused on that word deny. And you're just like, be a disciple, deny, deny, deny. And so we're like, okay, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll try. But man, and it's just like a diet, deny. <laughs> right? And so you're like, yes, January 2nd, I'm doing it. Starting this diet again. I'm going to deny myself, right? So I can get better shape. I can lose weight. And what happens? One month later. One week later. Okay, let's be honest. One day later, you've completely dropped it. Because you were just trying to deny yourself. What we miss is that word before, if anyone wants to be my disciple. And that Greek word, we looked at it last week. We can put that back up again. It's if you have a longing, if you have a desire, if you, if you are, are, are having this want. 
You see, that's, that's how we're, we're motivated as humans. So here, here is my premise. If you're going to be a disciple, if you're going to go on this discipleship journey, you have to have these three loves. You, you, you have to have these three loves. Or you're either going to not start or you're going to peter out. Number one, you've got to experience the love of God. You've got to experience love from God. Number two, you have to experience love from community. Because remember, more important than just getting rational head knowledge, thoughts, practices, it's your attachment with people that actually transforms you. And number three, you've got to actually love yourself. Like when, when the, the, great com- the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and so- strength. And then it says in the second, love your neighbor as yourself. And I tell you, you'll stink at loving your neighbor if you don't love yourself. And how do you love yourself? By knowing how much God loves you. You've got to have a love for yourself and a godly confidence. I'm not saying like a self-made confidence because all you've accomplished and all you've done and how many ribbons you have on your wall and how many degrees you have and how much money is in your bank and how slick your hair is and how big your biceps are or, 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 or how cool your clothes. No, it's a godly confidence because you're like, oh my goodness, I am so loved. You know, you know, one of the things that made me fall in love with Steph more than any other thing is because I, I remember the day she looked at me and she was like, I, I really believe in you. Like, I, I really, I, I really think that you're going to impact the world. And I'm like, oh, oh. I mean, I, I remember I was driving on LaSalle Boulevard. I remember where I was on the road when she said that to me. Do you know the Bible says we love because he first loved us? We love because he first loved us. The only way you're going to fall in love with God in such a way that you're going to run after him, in such a way that you're going to be willing to deny yourself, is if you understand how much he loves you. As the fathers loved me, so have I loved you. So easy to get in this religious, works-based mentality. But your strength is going to run out. I remember um, when I was 40, and I had been going after this for quite a while. And I have this... We're doing our, our, you know, what's now our commission conference. And so a, a, a man named Floyd McClung is coming in to speak at it. And Floyd McClung, just paint the picture, he's, he's 6'5", about 260 pounds, um, big gray mustache, always this big smile on his face. And uh, he had been the international director of YWAM. He had served the Lord in all these different, uh, these different ministries. And so he's coming in, so I'm thinking, I'm going to get some time with him. What's the question I want to ask him? And so here's the question I asked. I, I said, Floyd, how can I be so driven and yet walk in peace and rest? Like, I, I feel like I'm so driven that I can't walk in peace and rest. And I, and I think that God wants me to walk in peace and rest and, like, security. And he looked at me and he said this. Robert, you need a greater revelation of God's love for you. And this was my answer. I went, Floyd, (laughs) I travel around preaching on the love of God. Like, I I teach on that. And I said, furthermore, I'm, I'm kind of, I have had an unusual life that I really had a loving father. Like, my dad is really loving and then I was so blessed that when I married Steph, I got a really loving father-in-law. And then I even had two loving grandfathers. And then I've even had a, a, a loving mentor. Like, I think I've had a lot of love. I said, but the problem is, 
I, I don't think it's that I haven't felt loved in life. I think it's actually that I don't, I don't love and accept myself. Like, I, I can never do enough to actually feel. And he goes, exactly. You need a greater revelation of the Father's love for you. And I looked at him for a second, and I thought, okay, here's a 70-year-old that wrote the book called The Father Heart of God. I probably need to listen to him. He's probably right. I'm probably wrong. He said, Robert, if you truly receive the love of the Father, you'll be deliberate, not driven. You'll live deliberate, but not driven. Because when you're driven, you're always trying to earn love. You're always trying to prove something. So I go home that day, and, I, and I'm in, in my study, and, I, and so I decide to ask the Lord the question, Lord, is that really, is that, is that what I'm missing in life, a greater revelation of your love for me? And I sense the Lord going, yes. And so here's what I know. I, I, I know that so oftentimes when we live not embracing a truth, it's because we've embraced a lie. So I said, Lord, would you show me where I embrace the lie that I'm never enough? And I was taken into a memory. I was taken into a memory of me being five years old. And I'm in my grandfather's house. It was actually a mansion. I'm in my grandfather's mansion. And you got to understand about my, my grandfather. Um, he was a self-made millionaire, so had businesses and made a, a fortune. Then he was the mayor of our city, and then he started the Texas Baptist Children's Home, like this massive orphanage. And here I am, a five-year-old in this memory, and I'm looking at him, and this thought comes on me like a wet blanket. You'll never be okay unless you do all and more than he has accomplished. You'll never be okay unless you do all and more than he's accomplished. And I felt that lie. It was at that moment at five years old that that lie penetrated my heart. And what a yoke to spend your whole life feeling like you have to measure up to this giant and actually outperform him. And I realized at 40 years old, I'm still carrying that. And I, you know, I kind of started to cry and I'm like, Lord, would you speak your truth? And you never know how he's going to do it. Like, God always does something different. And in this moment, this is what I see. I have my eyes closed, and I have a vision. I still can see it so clearly. I have a vision of a big hand. And I knew it was the Lord's hand. Never seen anything like this before. A big hand comes through the room and wraps around my chest. Just like a, a father's big hand would wrap around his his baby's chest. And God speaks to me these two phrases. You're not like him. You're a supernatural man. And in that moment, I started feeling like I, I actually kind of felt like, and I'm seeing in my, this vision, kind of my, my spirit just going and, and unifying with the Lord. Um, can I prove that happened? No. Um, but what it did in me, I just wept. Because that yoke of feeling like I had to accomplish to be okay with myself, that I had to measure up to my grandfather, that I had to outperform him, in that moment, it fell off. And I felt the love of God. I mean, and I've been changed. Now, am I 100% changed? No. Can I still deal with drivenness? Yes. But I want to tell you that there's been a marked difference since, that, since I had that experience with the love of God. Look at this scripture. John 14. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. What if your life became home with the living God. 
Let me draw it this way. It all starts with God's It all starts with God's love. Right? That the Bible says we we love because he first loved us. Like the only way you're going to actually be passionate about God is when you receive his love. The only reason you're here is because he's loved you. He's been drawing you. So God's love. So then what happens is that we love God. But then if you want to move past that, what the scripture is saying is, if Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my commands. So then you have to make that decision like many of you did last week. Okay, okay, I realize you love me and I love you. And so the rightful response is I'm signing up to be your disciple. And so he says, if anyone loves me, they'll obey my commands. But then watch the next part. He says, and I will show myself to him. Uh, on our, what was it, our 10-year anniversary? Or I think it was our 10-year anniversary. We went to Yosemite, okay? And, and, and people had told me, like, that's God's country, Yosemite. It's beautiful. And I thought, hmm, I've traveled around the world. We'll see. And we go through the ranger station, and we're driving into Yosemite Park, and I'm like, bummer. This is just like mountains and trees. I've seen this before. And then I was like, oh, this is interesting. We're about to drive through a tunnel. And we drive through this tunnel, and it's, you know, it's dark, and we're just... And all of a sudden, I'm seeing all these taillights going like this. They're all veering over. I'm like, wait, oh, there must be an accident. Everyone's veering over. And we come through the tunnel. I would never experienced something like this. I was overwhelmed by the beauty of the Yosemite Valley, of Half Dome, of the falls, of the valley. And I just went, and my car, I just, it was involuntary to turn over and I stumble out of my car. Like, and I'm, I'm watching people like zombies just stumbling out of their car. It wasn't hard to wake up in the morning to want to go out and hike. It was actually hard to leave. He who obeys me, he says, I'll show myself. J Judas says, not, not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas says, shows himself. He says, Lord, why are you revealing yourself to us? And not to the world. He goes, because you love me and you obey me. So God loves you and you love him back. But here's the thing. If you actually follow, if you actually obey, he's going to show you more. He's actually, you're not going to see from a distance. Some of you are like, I haven't experienced God. Well, keep chasing. Because he says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And then here's what happens. He shows himself. And then what happens is you're like, wow, I'm overwhelmed with more of God's love. And then I love him more. And then I want to obey him more. And then he shows himself more. And then I get more of God's love. And then I love him more. So we'll end with this. What I'm not saying today is try harder. Do more. What I'm actually saying today is fall in love. I'm telling you the very thing you're created for. And then let me finish by giving you a cheat code. Because I loved when I started playing Nintendo when I learned about cheat codes. And I could get like to the end of Mario Brothers without having to go through every level. Or fight Mike Tyson without having to fight every single fighter. There was like a little cheat code. Here's the cheat code. Paul said to ask the Lord to pour out a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you can know him better. Pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Ask God to let you see him more so you fall more in love, so you love him more. Well, stand up. I am convinced that we are going to have a church 
of unwavering and unstoppable disciples and disciple makers if you actually get the fuel, which is love. Would you put your hand on your heart? And would you just pray this? You can pray it out loud. God, let me see you. God, let me fall more in love with you. I want to dare you to pray that every day. Because the greatest goal of this life is to fall more in love with God. I just have a prayer team come forward. I know that there's different needs, different ones of you. There, there's such needs that it's hard for you to even focus because that your needs are so in front of you. Maybe it's physical healing or brokenness in a relationship or financial pressures. We, wanna, we do want to pray for you because we're a loving community. We want to meet you where you're at. The rest of us, let's just, let's just sing one last song. And you just ask God to give you the gift of more love for him. And ask God to let you experience more of his love because if you experience it, you'll be changed.